Hi, everyone. Welcome to Food Talk Live. I'm your host, Danny Nirenberg. This is part of our monthly series presented by the Global Alliance for the Future of Food, the International Fund for Agricultural Development, and Food Tank to highlight the work of the UN Food System Champions in the lead up to the UN Food System Summit taking place this year. Today's conversation is, is um, uh, the fourth among seven panel discussions featuring members of the UN Food System Champions Network. Each panel focuses on one of the Global Alliance for the Future of Food's seven calls to action, which help identify critical pathways to create a better food, uh, a better future of food and agriculture. It's my sincere pleasure to co-host this series with Ruth Richardson, the Executive Director of the Global Alliance for the Future of Food, and the Chair of the Champions Network of the UN Food System Summit. This panel will focus on the following call to action, direct public sector finance and fiscal policy across the value chain towards ecologically beneficial forms of farming, better and healthier food, a resilient livelihoods and communities. And I really love this call for changing how fiscal policies are structured. And it couldn't be more important than it is today with the urgency of rising hunger as a result of the pandemic and the increasing impacts of the climate crisis. And I'm thrilled that we have a great group of panelists to talk about these issues. It's my pleasure to introduce Gabriela Cuevos Barron, a member of the Parliament of the uh, Mexican Congress, as well as a current member of the Universal Healthcare Coverage Movement Political Advisory Panel and co chair of the UHC 2030 Steering Committee. She was elected uh, a federal member of Parliament for the first time at age 21. She is also the co-chair of the Lancet COVID-19 Commission Task Force on Humanitarian Relief, Social Protection, and Vulnerable Groups. And she's a member of the Task Force on Global Health Diplomacy and Cooperation and the Regional Task Force for, last, uh, for Latin America. Next, we have uh, Vijay Kumar the co-vice chairman of uh, Rithu Sadikara Samsta, I hope I got that at least a little bit right, a company for farmers empowerment. He is also the advisor to the government of Andhra Pradesh for agriculture. He is leading the implementation of the climate resilient zero budget natural farming in the entire state of Andhra Pradesh. Prior to this, he was the first mission director of the National Rural Livelihoods Mission and later served as special secretary of agriculture uh, for the government of Andhra Pradesh. And last but not least, we have Lasa Brun, uh, the executive director of 50 by 40. He's a leader in climate and energy, sustainable agriculture, social justice, and animal rights, with 20 years experience in development, mobilization, communication, campaigning, and movement building. Previously, he has served as a global project leader at Greenpeace, an advisor in the Danish parliament, and the head of energy transition at Climate Action Network. Thank you all so much for being here. It's a real honor to have you. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Ruth. Uh, Ruth, I'm really hoping you can set the scene a bit here. There are some really big issues at play today. Yes, thank you, Danny, and I agree. <laughs> I'm <laughs> delighted to be here with you again for this fourth webinar. Um, and I'm thrilled to have our roster of speakers on this topic and to welcome everyone who has tuned into the session today. Uh, on the Global Alliance, uh, just so everybody knows, the Global Alliance is a strategic alliance of philanthropies working together and with others to transform food systems. Our vision is food systems that are renewable, healthy, equitable, resilient, diverse, inclusive, and interconnected. In terms of our calls to action, we have done um, eight years of research, dialogue, and engagement and this has resulted in the creation of seven calls to action or seven critical pathways to systems transformation. The fourth of which we're discussing today, which of course you've mentioned is on public finance. In terms of the UN Food Systems Champions Network, it is fantastic to have members of the network of which I have the privilege to be chair, um, join us today to discuss this important issues. Uh, who are the champions? Well, the Champions Network is made up of individuals and organizations across sectors and geographies who are champions of food systems and who will contribute to the UN Food Systems Summit by supporting other summit structures like the action tracks, uh, by acting as a sounding board for the recommendations that will be put forward, um, and importantly, by engaging their networks through hosting independent dialogues as well as through other means. Uh, it's a really fantastic and growing group of people, including the folks we have on the call today alongside our other guests. 
So I'm excited to hear um, from them about public finance, which as you say, is such a critical topic. On that subject, um, public finance is so central to food systems transformation and to the potential to shift those systems so that they are more equitable, resilient, and sustainable. When people refer to public finance and food systems, they often refer to production and to subsidies. But public finance relates to more than that. Um, there are public financial supports across the value chain from production through to processing and consumption, even in terms of externalized impacts like healthcare costs and government support for our medical systems. As well, public finance relates not just to subsidies, but to other public financial incentives and disincentives like taxes and even procurement policies, which are more on the policy side, but they're very much connected to public finance supports. So public finance impacts all food systems from production to consumption, whether that's through subsidies and incentives, taxes or other resources. Um, and as you note, because of that, there are really big issues and big questions for us to dive into. As you mentioned, our bold call to action on public finance asks for direct, asks that we direct public sector finance and fiscal policies across the value chain toward ecologically beneficial forms of farming, better and healthier food, and resilient livelihoods and communities. We at the Global Alliance are advocating for a break from harmful subsidies and perverse incentives with well-designed and durable reforms through collaborations between public servants, farmers, development banks, businesses, researchers, politicians, and implementing organizations. So with that as the premise, um, for me, some of the questions that I would love for us to discuss today and explore are things like, Governments provide a significant amount of support to their agricultural sectors. How do we break from these harmful subsidies and perverse incentives? Or what would well-designed and durable reforms look like? How can we actually engineer these meaningful and effective collaborations between different stakeholders? So if it works for you, Danny, I'd like to use that as the jumping off point to ask the first question. And I'm going to pose that first question to Lassa. So Lassa, from your vantage point, what is the state of fiscal policy's influence on agriculture and food systems? Over to you. Thanks a lot, Ruth. And thanks so much, Ruth and Danny, for having me here today. What a pleasure and an honor to be at this with these esteemed guests and in this very large conversation, as you say, Ruth. Well, your introduction, you kind of said what we need to do because I very much support what Global Alliance for the Future of Food is, is uh, advocating for what we do. But what does that mean concretely? And that's, I guess, what we kind of try to dig a little bit more into today. Well, I guess a starting point would be that, you know, the fiscal policies, uh, as you mentioned, tax and subsidies are um, highly influencing our food system. And um, it's not looking too good, really, because um, most people know that the, the report that came out last year, the, the state of food security and nutrition in the world, says that actually 3 billion people, almost half the world population, cannot afford healthy food, a healthy diet. And that is even though that there is no like inherent um, causes for why unhealthy food should be cheaper than healthy food. So that's kind of the starting point. We are not in a good position. Um, and it also, it comes down to how as is the, the systems um, running in terms of uh, uh, providing subsidies for farmers. As you say, subsidies is just one thing. But if you look at um, another report from OECD that says that about 500 million, sorry, $500 billion are given to farm farms every year, which is actually given in a wrong way that distorts the markets and they stifle innovation and harm the environment. And of course, with that public health. So where do we start? How do we start breaking down some of these, uh, these problems? Well, I think you touched a little bit on it in the beginning. Um, first of all, people need to get their, their uh, uh, ship in order uh, at a domestic level, because right now, one of the biggest problems we're seeing, even from a country level, is that there is a misalignment between dietary guidelines that a, a country puts forward as, as recommendations for what people should be eating to stay, remain healthy, and also to support the uh, nature-based solutions. 
and what the subsidies or taxation or lack of it actually supports. So first of all, at the national level, there needs to be a big change there. And as you said as well, public procurement plays a massive role there. Again, there is often a very big misalignment or discrepancy between how public procurement is carried out at a national, sorry, at a subnational level, for instance, in cities, municipalities, or in, in regions and states, compared to the federal policy. So there's a need to, to make sure that there's a stronger alignment there. In addition to that, um, and of course, very um, um, relevant in, in the lights of the UN Food System Summit, is that how do we take the hopefully future um, uh, collaboration at a subnational national level to in, introduce that at an international multilateral level as well. And that's where it gets really, really tricky because of uh, trade issues and carbon carbon issues, sorry, tax, taxation internationally is such a, um, a complicated issue that even like discussing it in four like this often makes the conversations break down because it's too complicated to uncover in a very short amount of time. And that also is indicative of how difficult it is for many national governments to, to deal with this. And that again pertains to the aspect of uh, the, the current uh, fiscal uh, policies that are in place are predominantly suiting the biggest producers. So like the big, big food industries and to a large extent, the commodity markets, as opposed to supporting the actual smallhold uh, farmers which I know we probably will be touching on uh, later today. So I think it's important to, to take those, uh, those aspects into consideration. One thing I want to add, and I'll finish with that, is that there's also the larger uh, financial aspects in, in play here, like what the multilateral, multilateral development banks are doing. So like how banks like the World Bank, the European Bank for Reconstruction Development, African Development Bank are supporting the wrong food systems as opposed to the right ones. So there's all these elements there. And I know with this answer, I didn't provide much solutions, but I think it's important we understand the complexity of the issue. Great context setting, um, Lasse, thank you. And I, I really appreciate you pulling some things together like um, hunger, poverty, um, environmental um, integrity, um, and seeing those as interconnected issues. And then I really appreciate you showing us where things are too disconnected in terms of how dietary guidelines and procurement line up with um, public support. So really appreciate you setting that landscape for us. Danny, over to you. Thanks so much, Ruth and Lassa. So uh, this is really a question uh, for all of you, and it, it relates to our previous panel in this series uh, about the hidden costs of, of the food system. And some of the panelists noted during that event that our financial systems are, are really geared towards short-term aims. And I'm wondering if you can all speak about the historical reasons for this and, and what changes really need to help uh, to occur to help prioritize the long-term health of our food systems. And uh, Gabriella, I don't know if you'd like to go first. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for the kind invitation. Well, uh, it has to do, I think, in many ways on how we are building policies and legislation. As a parliamentarian myself, I think that we need to have a, a long-term perspective when it comes to sustainability, when it comes to food, when it comes to fighting hunger and poverty. And in this case, uh, we do have a very important tools from the parliament. The first one is legislation. We are in charge of developing all the legislation that can bring that long-term perspective to the table. And that's one of the instruments. But there's another very powerful instrument, which is the budget. Budgets are designed at the first stage mostly by the executives, but then they go as a proposal to the legislatives, to the parliament or to the congresses. And then we we have a discussion, a real discussion, and we sometimes relocate that that money, that uh, that budget, into different uh, uh, projects or, or fields or issues. When it comes to again fighting hunger, to developing strong health systems, we need to understand it first yeah, as a system, as a very comprehensive uh, uh, approach. We cannot only say I'm going to allocate uh, this amount to this very specific part of the system because then we, we can make uh, some asymmetries. So uh, in this case, I think that as parliamentarians 
and also civil society should take a stronger look on how budgets are being uh, voted and designed by governments and the parliaments. And then again, we can take a look to taxes, to subsidies, to the different ways on how, how we are going to give perhaps some incentives to some parts of the industry, or if we are going to, to find, uh, for example, and, and, and perhaps we should bring also that to the table. Sometimes now food issues are also related to free trade agreements. So how are we going to balance our international commitments with the national needs? Because that's also something that is coming now to the table in many, many countries. So we do have uh, different uh, tools as parliamentarians. And the other one is also uh, oversight. We are in charge of making the government accountable, and we are also accountable ourselves. But we need to work with the government in order to see that the legislation, our international commitments, the budget, all the different instruments are being very well used. Great, thank you so much for that very clear explanation. Uh, Vijay, would you like to go next? Yeah, I was, uh, uh, you know, uh, I just want to take off uh, on what Lasso mentioned and also on the call to action. I, I agree with the call to action, but I also realize it's difficult. Uh, but one part of the puzzle as to why it is difficult is perhaps the fiscal, different fiscal actions, taxes, the link between what their aims and what they're resulting in. I suppose that's not clear. So maybe in good intentions, we are doing harm. So one piece of research which according to me is missing is, can we say whether each tax, each set of policy, is it leading to climate positive actions, whether it's on the production or consumption? So just as we are talking about the need for true cost accounting, similarly, there must be a, a very good analysis of the budgets, the various uh, taxation policies uh, in terms of, uh, you know, whether it is resulting in desirable action or not. I think that is one thing which comes to me from uh, why people are not, you know, moving in the right direction. The, the second thing is the, it's very difficult to actually deal with subsidies because if you want to get rid of a subsidy there's a there's a lot of vested interest there's a lot of assumptions behind these subsidies so uh, i mean it's uh, i've been in government for a very long time and i realize it's uh, it's very difficult uh, so so therefore perhaps there is a need to be smart about it uh, so I think you can't go head on in the in dealing with subsidies. One of the most uh, pernicious subsidies that we have seen in India, perhaps it's there in other countries, is the subsidy that is being given on chemical fertilizers. Now, it was introduced with a good intention that it should you know, reduce the cost of cultivation for the farmers. And now it's very difficult for anybody to change that. Even though we know that uh, the, it's leading to indebtedness, it's leading to other environmental consequences. So I just give, gave this example, there could be others where the, there, there was a good intention behind the subsidy, but today it's become dysfunctional. So I'll stop here uh, because the, you know, it's a, it's a very complicated uh, uh, issue. Absolutely, absolutely. And thank you for explaining, you know, the, the idea of unintended consequences. We have to think about these things very carefully. Lhasa, I, I'm interested in hearing what you have to say. Yeah, thanks a lot, Danielle. I mean, it, it always puzzles me when you look at this issue of, of uh, hidden costs. Um, I mean, you, you know the facts, facts and figures. Uh, about 1 billion people in, in high-income countries are obese and 1 billion people are undernourished in, in low-income countries. And uh, if you look at part of the, the problems driving that, again, it is uh, the, the, the fiscal policies. So if you look at the high-income countries, 
and the um, the current food um, food policies are actually supporting a food regime that is leading to cardiovascular diseases, type two diabetes, um, all kinds of uh, ailments, which um, which the costs for treating those by far by far outweighs what it would cost to shift the food production around to to be sustainable and affordable and available to everybody. So it's always it puzzles me that um, when uh, any country and I'm so glad you brought that up, Gabriele, when any country is dealing with budgets, that there isn't a stronger collaboration between the relevant departments. And for, for us here, I think if you would like maybe cut it down to four uh, um, government departments, it would be uh, agriculture, climate, health, and finance. And the finance part is often where it goes wrong because every time you talk about shifting the food system, moving away from the current support for large commodity uh, markets, then you end up in a situation where the ministers of finance, like they feel threatened, they feel this is going to hurt our GDP, this is going to hurt our budgets, this is going to make things more difficult. So I think one thing we can do to try to move away from the silo thinking at a national level and also how it trickles up to an international level is to to really demonstrate how shifting to a sustainable and healthy food system actually will be financially not only viable, but actually beneficial. It will likely create more jobs. It will likely um, revitalize rural economies and so forth. And so I think there is a lot of uh, work that needs to be done, and particularly this year, hence this conversation, to ensure that we help governments to see those missing links and often and in my experience as a lobbyist, I often am puzzled uh, that you talk to, to some government facilities and you say something that is second nature to what you do because you work with it. And you don't and you realize that often some governments are so focused on their own department that they really don't speak to their colleagues. So there, it sounds very pretentious, but it's just a state of things. And I think it's, it's important that it's an important aspect we need to to dig deeper on. Absolutely. And uh, Ruth, if you don't mind, I just want a quick follow up. I'm, I'm so glad Lassa mentioned the role of lobbyists and Gabriella had some very interesting things to say around, you know, how, how policymakers need to have long term thinking. But in, in the United States, where I happen to live, lobbyists have a lot of power over our policymakers and it prevents that long term thinking. So I'm wondering if maybe you, Gabriella and Vijay can sort of comment on that. I think that it is not about uh, uh, you and us. What we need to learn from this pandemic is that we need to work together or things are not going to happen well. We need to, as the, as the UN Secretary General has been saying, we need to build back better. But in order to make that happen, we need to change some uh, uh, very clear ideas. The first one is, how are you going to build a, a real sustainable planet? And when it comes to, to food systems, it makes a lot of sense because if we do not take care of our planet, well, then we're not going to have food. It's a very linear thinking. We don't need rocket science here. We need to take care of the planet because otherwise we're not going to exist. And that means that we need science. We need a, a more rational and real information when we are, for example, designing which land, very basic urban planning, or in this case, rural planning, which land are we going to use for developing which kind of food? Where, where are we going to, uh, to grow food because there's water and, and there are places without water or perhaps we are not taking care of our, our resources. And that's happening in many places that are being uh, dried. The, the other side, uh, yes, sustainability is one of the pillars that we need to, to take care of. And the other one, I think it's a uh, gender lens. We cannot continue thinking that women can be left behind. Women and girls are an indispensable part of our economies, politics, and of course, agriculture. Well, we, we, there are very interesting data where they, they are saying, well, if we really include women in the food systems, we can have 30% growth in this sector. And that means not only like having a decree, 
that means having real policies. For example, how are we going to make a financial inclusion of women? How are we going to design specific taxes with gender lens? How are we going to design subsidies? How are we going to get women involved in all the, 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 the chain? So we have a lot of things to do. And that goes to, again, to all different uh, uh, stakeholders. We need uh, civil society, we need private businesses, we need politicians, we need all of them. And I believe that what could be very interesting about the Food Summit, it's precisely that they are being designed with all different stakeholders. It is about sitting different people, sitting the plurality to the same table and to have advocacy, dialogue, and I hope mobilization, because the real challenge now Yes, is to have all these dialogues to create the content for the different uh, conversations. But then we are going to need to use whatever a world outcome is being prepared. We need to bring that to the national and local level to make that a, a reality for the people that we represent or the people that we work with in, in our communities. Absolutely. It's not enough just to bring everyone to the table. You have to have action afterwards. And thank you for, for identifying the need for a gender lens on these issues. Uh, Vijay, very quickly, do you want to comment on on, on the role of, of uh, law? Couldn't hear you, Daniel. Last Sorry. Part. Do you want to comment on on the role of, of governments, uh, long term yeah. thinking and and, you know, sort of uh, the short sightedness uh, that we often see because of the power of lobbies? Yes, definitely. I also want to uh, emphasize that we should be smarter than the lobbies. So I just want to give uh, examples from my own uh, uh, work here. We are implementing a 250 million US dollar program for transforming 1 million farmers. And, you know, I need to raise about 1.4 billion dollars to ensure that all farmers in my state move into uh, sustainable, climate resilient agriculture. So I'm in discussion with my finance department and I have told them that I can save money for the government by reducing the subsidy given for electricity because natural farming reduces water usage and electricity anywhere from 30 to 50%. So even on a conservative 25% reduction in electricity subsidy over the next 10 years, I can save around $2.4 billion to the government in lesser electricity subsidies. And uh, similarly, you know, fertilizer subsidies. If farmers don't buy chemical fertilizers, the government saves money. So instead of government saying that we will not give subsidy, we are coming from the other side we're telling farmers not to take those chemical fertilizers. So the saving to government, if all farmers in my state over the next 10 years don't use chemical fertilizers, the saving is around $4.9 billion. So the total saving comes to around $7.3 billion. And all I need is $1.4 billion. So it's, it's a question of being smart using evidence. Because the finance department told me that you please give me the evidence and you take the money. So I'm in that, I'm now working out on a very large scale, this measurement on how much water we're able to save and how much, uh, you know, electricity we're able to save. But beyond this, I can also see other savings for the government. One is on the health expenditure, which is little intangible, but still needs to be measured, quantified and brought onto the table for discussion. I also see reduction in the insurance premium for agriculture, because once agriculture becomes less risky, the farmers and the government need to pay less on or need to spend less money on account of premiums, reduced uh, interest rates for uh, banks. So uh, I want to go back to my first point that we need to quantify different taxes, different policies. If they are currently pushing a wrong system through these uh, measures if they are able to you know support the way in which you can actually have food food and nutrition security 
so so that clarity if it comes is brought on to the table discussed agreed upon i can i see a lot of action from government is possible fantastic fantastic and i'm really glad that you dispelled the myth that sustainable farming practices are more expensive than you know conventional i, I think that's such a great point to make ruth over to you uh one second uh, I, I i just one last point because it's not just not only savings to government i said you know 2.4 billion dollars and 4.9 billion dollars savings in subsidy this also means additional income of 10 billion us dollars to farmers mm -hmm. so it's a win 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 for farmers for uh, you know the planet and the government DJ, Fantastic point. Sorry, Ruth, go ahead. Uh, no, I was just going to say, DJ read my mind because that's where I was going to take <laughs> the next question. I just think what you're doing in Andhra Pradesh is so uh, so interesting and potentially very powerful, uh, VJ. And um, and I've had the pleasure of touring what you're doing there, and it's truly amazing. Um, and the question I wanted to ask you, and you sort of half answered, but I would love to hear more, um, is you talked about savings um, on the savings side, but then you know, there's so many positive benefits on the other side where through these public finance mechanisms, we can really build other, um, you know, sort of positive um, impacts and benefits kind of within states and countries. Gabriella, for instance, mentioned gender. And I know that, you know, your initiative is so um, connected to women smallholder farmers. So I wanted to ask sort of two questions. First is you could, could you paint a picture in Andhra Pradesh in terms of some of those other positive benefits um, related to public finance. And then could you just talk a little bit from your experience about what are the real challenges and what are the opportunities to shift governments? What are you finding in real life on the ground? Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, the, the change that we are bringing on ground is possible because of the women farmers having been organized. So it was a 20 years effort by government to build a movement where around 8.3 million rural women in Andhra Pradesh are organized into collectives. And uh, there is complete financial inclusion. They're able to borrow from the banks. And the women are the ones who have driven this transformation. So I agree with you, public investment in building the social capital is is a, according to me, is a, a precondition. And uh, we are now seeing the different departments in the government, the Department of Women and Child Development uh, wants us to help them in the preschool uh, feeding program. So in the preschools, the food produced is, you know, now going to be completely from the natural farming uh, farmers. And now the education department has asked me to now work with them on the school nutrition program. So we are getting this buy-ins from different departments. But uh, Ruth, uh, the, the problem is not just with government. The problem also is, I mean, not just with finances. I mean, uh, problem is not just with financing it. The problem also is in preparing communities, in actually working at the ground level, building a strong, uh, women farmers networks, other farmers. So if you don't do that, even if the government you know, wants to put in money, action will not happen. So finance, public policy is not a silver bullet. It has to be combined with uh, the action, the science, the evidence. So, so it's, a, it's a matrix. It has to, all this has to uh, come together. Because let us say if a state is not prepared, but the government says, okay, I'll give you $5 billion, they'll not know what to do. So, and that's where I see the role of philanthropy coming. Uh, and we have been helped by $16 million from, a, from Azim Premji Philanthropy, one of the largest philanthropies in India. That helped us to incubate the program. That helped us to build evidence. So, so therefore, you have government, finances, philanthropies, banks, and then concrete, uh, you know, grassroots action, science on the ground. So it's a, it's a multi-actor kind of a process. 
Uh, but yes, this is a very important piece, you know, <laughs> because without this kind of initial money, uh, you can't get the other results. But I also want to say that, you know, much as I appreciate international platforms, I see that we should not miss out on action at the local level, regional level, sub-national, national levels. I think they are very, very important actors. Mm. Thank you, Vijay, um, and uh, appreciate you pointing out the other financial flows that need to go alongside that. Um, that is our call to action number five, which will be the next webinar, so we'll have to get you back on that one. <laughs> but appreciate you pointing out Azim Premji Philanthropic Initiatives, a member of the Global Alliance and, and critical to the support and the early funding behind um, your initiative. Um, so thank you for that. And thank you for sort of painting a picture for us um, what's happening in Andhra Pradesh and in India. I'd like to um, uh, point the next question at Lassa. Lassa, in your experience and, and working a lot at kind of the global level, where else are you seeing positive examples of public finance? Can you, um, you know, Vijay's talked about it in India, but would love to hear if you're seeing um, real breakthroughs in other jurisdictions um, just based on your vantage point. Thank you, Ruth. Um, well, to be honest, I mean, the some examples are some of the, the uh, taxation schemes that have been put forward on uh, sugar, salt and fat in, in some countries, particularly in Northern Europe. Um, they have been various levels of success, but they have, at least they have rattled the cage, to li cage a little bit and demonstrated that when you start taxing food items that are not good for people, it actually trickles down and, and the, the the buying habits do change. Um, that's really important to, to, to demonstrate. And I know there are many countries that I know lots of conversations behind the scenes. I would love to hear what Vijay and Gabriela has to say about this, about carbon taxing on food at a much larger comprehensive scale, which it definitely would be a game changer. Um, to my extent, there are not any you know, larger uh, existing uh, examples of car carbon uh, taxing of food across the board, but that would essentially also be be a, a game changer, particularly as it pertains to the overconsumption of animal protein, as we've seen in the particularly high income countries. Uh, taxation of food as it relates to the, the carbon footprint would be an interesting way to go. I want to mention that there are some existing larger programs in place around the world, which is um, but not necessarily are doing really amazing work now, but has the potential to do that. In the US, for instance, they have the SNAP program, which is the uh, what's Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, which essentially helps um, uh, support uh, measures that enables uh, people, particularly low-income uh, uh, groups and uh, BIPOC groups to, to have access to uh, affordable, uh, healthy uh, food. And also it deals with uh, like tips into the issue of national school launch programs. So that's something I think could be explored more like take some of the existing platforms and make them even better. But I think if I have to mention one thing, it is publicly public procurement coming back to that uh, at a local level and supporting what Vijay is saying. You should not underestimate the power of what kind of food you're sourcing for schools, retirement homes, prisons, uh, any public institutions, because when a national decision maker has to to look into how they can change the subsidies, they're also looking to how things are dealt with on the ground. And if you can demonstrate that certain uh, municipalities, states, and other regions are actually subsidizing, sorry, are actually sourcing the right food and putting in place public procurements that support healthy and sustainable food, it's much easier to make that overall national decision on policies that support that. So the bottom-up approach here, I think is very strong. So I would definitely support what Vijay is saying in terms of keeping a strong focus on sub-national engagement and seeing how that bottom-up approach can meet the top-down at yeah. the same time. Fantastic, thank you. I think sometimes when we hear subsidies and taxes, we always think all bad. And you know we're trying to look for the good. And what I'm hearing from you is, is perhaps we're not there yet in terms of there being really great examples, but certainly a ton of potential, which actually gives us a fantastic platform as a global community to really think about where that potential lies and how we seize it. So thank you for that. Danny. 
Thanks so much, Ruth. I, I want to go to a, a question from the audience. Uh, Florence, it's up on the screen right now. I'll read it for our listeners who will uh, be listening to the podcast later on. Good point, but we use need to use composite indicators for justifying taxation of food items, not only nutrition and health, but also environmental impact and social justice, as well as animal welfare. I'm wondering who'd like to comment on that. Maybe Lhasa, that you could take that one as well. Yeah, I can just be very brief. I totally agree. Thanks for the question, Florence. I very much agree with the with the point you're making. Um, and that also pertains to what was brought up earlier in the in the conversation around the uh, the necessity to look at the long term effects and also the hidden costs, right? So, and and you're seeing that you know if you talk about carbon taxing and like how you want to change how people uh, um, are eating and how the subsidies or policies can help that, uh, I think we're on the on the, the cusp of a generational shift that will change things as well. Uh, I think younger people, how do I phrase this, maybe millennials and downwards, are as interested in the long-term effects of what they eat as their immediate effects on their bodies and their local environments. So um, tapping into that potential and making sure that voters and consumers are pushing and supporting a change at a policy level that will uh, include those uh, externalized factors like health, like animal welfare, like like uh, uh, pollution of local uh, in environments from uh, big, big CAFOs, whatever it might be, I think is, is, a, is a very important point. And I think that uh, it comes back to what I said earlier, like a stronger collaboration between the individual departments in governments is crucial to making that happen. I really love that point. I know uh, Robert Martin from the Center for a Livable Future is watching today. He commented in the, the comment section and he he calls for this idea of a citizen eater. And I think that fits so closely to what you said, Lassa, about, you know, this really VJ and, and all of you have really mentioned the need for uh, action from the ground up and, and citizens have a real role to play in, in how the food system looks. And especially young people, as you mentioned, Lhasa, with, you know, they're, they're not only thinking of how food affects them today, but for tomorrow as well. Um, Gabriella, I, I want to turn back to something you said earlier about how, you know, the UN Food System Summit can be a real catalyst for change. And, and both you and Lhasa have, have talked quite a bit about this. I, uh, you know, Lhasa has called for, um, has said in, a, in an interview that the UN Food System Summit can be like the Paris Agreement for food. And I'm wondering kind of what you all think about how we can use this uh, as, a, as a leverage point to really develop better fiscal policies that have a, an international impact. Yes, of course, we, we need a... Uh, uh, an understanding, we need a conversation, we need a, to, to address the same topics at the world level because we have only one planet. It's not like one country which is not capable of a growing food is going to find another one to give them all what they are producing. So this is a matter for humanity. It is about sustainability, it's about inclusiveness. So we need to have that conversation at the world level. But of course, that conversation needs to have different perspectives. For example, now we're talking about consumption and production. And, and we need also to, to point out several issues that I think that are being very interesting in the, in the questions that we are receiving. For example, how are we going to legislate at, yeah, at the national level, but we need a, a clear criteria on fertilizers that are killing the planet. Not all of them, of course, but there are some fertilizers that are making a real damage. How are we going to, to work or how are we going to legislate or to label GMOs? How are we going to uh, bring up all, all science that is behind of these things? And sometimes we cannot differentiate on what is truth and what is not. There are a lot of, fake news, there are a lot of uh, new ideas that are even putting uh, our risk, our health at risk. So we, we need to have that conversation, that kind of world uh, level agreement. But in my experience, I used to, to preside a world organization of, of parliaments, the Interparliamentary Union, and I am also a national lawmaker. When we try to really translate this international agreement 
into national and local realities, there are several challenges. First, because we need to understand that we are uh, interdependent. We cannot say, like, my country is going to be first and only. We need to understand that the world is linked to each other. And this pandemic has, has been showing that day by day. The second part is that we need a clearer roadmap for the national implementation. Things are not going to happen just because. Things are only happening if we work every day to make that happen. And that is very important, I think, to have parliamentarians, civil society, academia, to have all different stakeholders sitting at the same tables at the UN Food Summit. I think that's very important because at the end, it is not only about government uh, implementation. We need all different people for that road of making things happen. And the, and the other side, I think that's, uh, that's part of the lessons on you were comparing with the Paris Agreement, is how are we going to make national plans? We need national goals. We need to have a national objectives and policies. And that brings me again to what legislators need to do all over the world. Laws, budgets, oversight, and I think one very important uh, responsibility is representation. We need to work with the people that we represent. We need to work with the communities because at the community level, it's precisely where things are happening. Bravo, that was excellent. I love the point about both interconnectedness and, and representation. Does anyone else want to comment on, on this theme around? Thank you, Lassa. Well, I just spoke. I'll let Vijay go first, please. Of course. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Uh, yeah, I wanted to make three points. Uh, one is, you know, if we can develop the science or put what is already known together so that the food label also says that this food was produced in a way which is helping climate or the planet to cool down. So it consumes less water, less energy. So that could be one area of work so that the millennials, they consume food. They know that this food is helping the planet. That's one point. The second one, I really agree the point of carbon tax. Uh, so that it promotes farming, which is actually putting carbon below the soil rather than releasing into the air. But the third point I'm going to mention is perhaps a very uh, controversial point or something like, let us say, uh, out of the box. You see, globally, the arable area is 1.60 billion hectares out of which 0 0.44 billion hectares are not being cultivated. They are left fallow. So there is a lot of carbon emission coming out of lands which are barren. We also have 5 billion hectares of what is called as man-made deserts, the Sahara, the Thar. They're also releasing huge amount of carbon into the air. So when we are looking at carbon emissions, we're only looking at you know, the fossil fuel emissions, but we're not looking at the emissions which are you know, coming out of the soils which are not covered with plants. So if you can visualize a taxation or a policy which says that any country which releases emissions because it's not cultivating those lands. So how do you green the planet so that you cool the planet and therefore can we look at fiscal policies which are not uh, you know which are also encouraging people we also need technologies to really ensure that lands which are barren come back into cultivation and there must be a strategy for greening the desert so therefore if we can expand the concept of a carbon tax and go beyond the fossil fuel emissions but also look at all forms in which you know carbon is being released into the air, then you may have a different solution. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lhasa. Yeah, maybe just a few points around the, the, the Paris, and, uh, Paris Agreement comparison there. I think, I mean, the, there are two things too. One's, one is methodology, 
the other ones are the goals and the implementation of the goals. So, you know, um, the Paris Agreement was led by a personal hero of mine, of many people, uh, Christina Figueres, and she really embraced the issue of systems leadership and radical collaboration to talk about real inclu inclusion, not leaving anybody behind. And I guess now what we can learn from that is two things. One is we cannot let perfection get in the way of progress, but also we need to have those hard conversations. So how can we move forward uh, with, with changing the food system uh, and not leaving anybody behind, but keeping the drum going, right? And a key aspect of learnings in terms of goals and implementability uh, of the Paris Agreement, how that pertains to the food system, um, one thing is the comment about differentiated responsibilities. We cannot talk about everybody, all the 197 member states of the UNFCCC, for instance, how they uh, deal with um, uh, decarbonization uh, because it's not fair, right? So we need to apply the same principle to food systems. Like low-income countries do not have the same responsibility. They have a responsibility, but not the same. The onus of the responsibility lies with the um, high-income countries, but often is the G7 countries, for instance. So that is something we can uh, take specifically from the Paris Agreement. And also talking about the implementation of it, and that's also what, what Gabriela was talking about. You know, in the Paris Agreement, you have the five-year ratchet up moments of the Paris Agreement. So every five years, last year, 2020 was the first year, each country has to come forward and say, this is what we did to make sure that we stay below 1.5 degrees above pre-industrialized le levels. We need to have the same things in place for the food system. And that's what I hope the food system summit can help put in place, that there is a responsibility, even though it's a voluntary engagement in the summit, it is there's a responsibility that comes with it. And uh, two more points. One is I think resilience should just be the overarching you know, point discourse outcome we're looking for. Because if you talk about true resilience across the, the food system, it speaks to production, consumption, food distribution and so forth. And then we should just let science talk. And the final point is around urgency. So um, I remember being in Copenhagen in, in 2009 for COP15 and saw how things did not work out very well to say the least. And from Copenhagen to the Paris Agreement was six years, right? So 2015 was when the Paris Agreement came together. And that was great. And the work that um, Christina Figueres and her team put into making that happen was just astounding. However, I want to make the point here, we do not have six years to spare now. We cannot wait six years until we have something as comprehensive as the, the Paris Agreement in place for the food system, because then we're going to be having a much more difficult time actually cleaning up the food system. So urgency is key here as well. Thank you. I couldn't agree, agree more on that urgency point. And, and thank you for making the points about how high income uh, countries really need to take a greater responsibility on building sustainable food systems. Um, and, and I love your point about letting science talk. Uh, Ruth, I'll, I'll turn it back to you now. Great. Thank you, Danny. I think uh, what I would like to do for maybe a final question is um, pull up what Lassa was just talking about in terms of leaving nobody behind and maybe giving Vijay and Gabriela um, an opportunity to speak to that. Because I think if we um, look at the sustainable development goals, certainly if we look at the, the ambitions of the UN Food System Summit, there's a real spotlight on vulnerable and marginalized communities and those that we really need to connect with, including youth, including women and um, girls, uh, including indigenous peoples, um, there are a number of priority communities. So how do we make sure our public finance is supporting equitable livelihoods and the, um, the inclusion and the support of these kinds of critical communities um, that will actually be so um, central to a better future of food? Um, so Vijay, can I turn to you first, and then I'm going to give Gabriela, as a woman, the last word. Vijay. Yeah. Uh uh, Ruth, I, I think we should change our lens. I believe very strongly it is the women, the indigenous farmers, the youth who can actually turn the world around. Mm -hmm. They should not be the objects of so-called pity. No, they are going to be the leaders. So we invest in them, the kind of impetus that will come because they they are the ones who can really make a change because in India, more than 55% of the population is uh, rural, dependent on agriculture. And agriculture has now become feminized. 
so it is up to the women farmers empowered women farmers who can bring about the transformation so we need to invest so that they can save us it's not we saving them the the second point i want to make is again by organizing collectives of women organizing indigenous people we are also able to reduce the uh, movement of food so that the the consumption also becomes more uh, you know substantive and uh, so it's both production and consumption should be seen together and how do we reduce that gap so so the organization empowerment of uh, women youth indigenous people is critical for this transformation to happen they have to lead this transformation thank you thank you vj very well said and gabriela over to you you get the final word thank you thank you very much ruth i think that we cannot see food systems or production or consumption isolated for example on how everything is linked when it comes for example we're, we're talking about the economy fiscal policy subsidies perhaps we we should take a look again to the sdgs and all the the 2030 agenda if if we think that uh, that vulnerable groups are vulnerable people i think we have the wrong perspective i think that is people that are in a condition of vulnerability but it is a condition and that condition it is our duty and that's uh, why i'm in politics it is our duty to help them to overcome that vulnerability that vulnerable situation or as a condition but not as, a, as something that defines the person the second part is that we do need to understand uh, uh, all policies in a very comprehensive way having always people at the center of our decisions especially when we are talking here about food systems we cannot lose perspective that it is about what persons are eating or producing how this is affecting the environment where we are living in how this is also having a direct impact for women's and girls lives so we need to take a look again to the to the, to the 2030 agenda because that's the main goal to make a more inclusive and sustainable planet and well if we if we see the numbers from the last year and the and the pandemic actions we are going backwards and we need to make a change we have one planet we have one humanity we need to make it work and so of course having the responsibility on uh, on how we build back together again we have to include all voices we need to uh, uh, implement the outcomes of the different world resolutions. I do believe in multilateralism, but the only way when multilateralism is going to make sense, it is when it is translated to local and national solutions, again, placing people at the center of all decisions. I, I wish all, all best for these dialogues. I think it has been a very productive one, and thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you, all of you, and um, that was beautiful, Gabriela really appreciate um, your wisdom um, on this. Danny, maybe I can just provide a couple of really quick um, um, thoughts in terms of wrap up. I have a ton of notes in front of me. I'm not gonna be able to get to all of them. I do wanna just pull up three really quick points. One is you all talked about the goals, the goals of the system, the goals of policy, the goals of taxation, including things like resilience and equity and diversity and inclusion. So I think it's really critical that we hold up those goals, values and principles in terms of what it is we're trying to achieve. The second thing is the number of tools and mechanisms and instruments that we have available from school nutrition programs to labor, labeling to procurement, dietary guidelines, legislation, budgets, taxation. We've got it all in the toolbox. Let's use it. And thirdly and finally, I just want to pull up what all of you said in terms of the real focus of public finance needing to be on, VJ, as you so beautifully put it, the leaders, the women, the youth, indigenous peoples that are going to lead us through this change. Um, and so we really have to think about who benefits and how we direct 
public finance for those um, communities and populations. And of course, connected to that, those communities and populations at the national and subnational and local levels. Um, so I have a lot more I could say because this was so rich. Thank you all. And Danny, over to you for final words. Thank you for that excellent wrap up, uh, Ruth. I'm always so glad that you do that instead of me. <laughs> um, I wanna thank everyone for joining us. This has been a wonderful discussion. Again, an honor to have you all. A reminder that this episode will also appear on our podcast, Food Talk with Danny Nirenberg. And I hope you'll join us again on April 29th uh, when we'll be discussing how to unlock private philanthropic and multilateral investment opportunities in sustainable food systems and better align those opportunities amongst actors for greater impact. Thank you all again. Please stay safe and well.